You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You are now entering the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, a show that uncovers what's fact, what's fake, and what's fun in the crazy world of pseudo archaeology. Hello and welcome to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 121. I am your host, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, and tonight I review Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. All right. So, hey man, it's nice to be back doing this, you know? And I wanted to start this podcast just with some bragging, like usual, talking about myself, talk about how great I am. And my brag for the week is that I ended up being on Wired. So Wired is a really big YouTube channel that's a descendant of Wired magazine And they do these like 15 minute long videos that are called support videos and they do them thematically. Often they'll have like a paleontologist on it or they'll have like a famous actor on it. This week they had an archaeologist on it and that archaeologist was me. So that was really enjoyable. I got out to a really broad audience and it was cool, man. Made me feel good doing that, being a part of it. It was it was a nice little moment there in my career. So, hey, go check it out if you want. But more importantly, what's the deal with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny? All right. This one's kind of tough for me, you guys, This, in terms of reviewing this, because I felt that the movie wasn't that bad. And I felt that the movie wasn't that good. I felt that it was an enigma of movies. <laughs> and I don't know. It's I, I'm going to take us through it, right? Like I usually do. Just using my uh, film degree, keeping it shiny, you know, double major in archaeology and film. I am the guy, of course, to do this reveal. You should listen to me. I've seen a lot of stuff online about how terrible Indiana Jones 5 is. I know it did poorly in the box office. Again, I think at this moment, I'm about what? It's been out about two weeks, and I think it very much underperformed expectations, you know, this kind of thing. But um, so what? You know, we want to take this with a fresh perspective and... You know what? If you feel like going to watch Indiana Jones 5, go watch it. Again, I'm still stewing over how I really feel about this movie. I wonder if six months from now, I'll disagree with the stuff I'm going to tell you guys tonight. I I can't really say. I do want to warn you, there will be a thousand and one spoilers. I will basically spoil everything. Because I really want to analyze this. I've, I've done this kind of thing once in the past. I did Indiana Jones 4 couple months ago because I knew Indiana Jones 5 was coming out, right? So I wanted to revisit Indiana Jones 4. How do I feel about this versus Indiana Jones 4? I do think Indiana Jones 5 is better than Indiana Jones 4, but uh, I'll talk I'll talk more about that later. It's just been difficult again to figure out what to say because there are these really negative reviews about this show and I agree with some of them. You know, I agree with aspects of what they're saying in terms of some of the negativity, but there are also things I really liked about this movie, too. It's it's a odd mix of stuff. And I think that happens because this is one of those movies that had about a thousand rewrites, a thousand edits. It's serving way too many masters. You know what I mean? A big Lucasfilm movie at this point owned by Disney. The the chances of this being sort of a cleanly made movie are just impossible. You know, there's just there's just too much going down. But with that said, let's go through this in the classic 
three act structure way. I want to go through the whole thing. Talk one act at a time. If we remember act one is, of course, the beginning of the movie. We meet our main characters. There's going to be sort of some big problem or some big call to adventure, right? The main character will refuse the call. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't do that. You know, I'm too tired. I'm too old. I did it before. Whatever it is. But then something will happen where they then decide I'll take it on after all. And then they go on their adventure. And once they kind of make that choice and they go off on their adventure, then we're into act two, right? And act two is usually the long act in movies. There's a bunch of new allies. You meet a bunch of new enemies. There's just a bunch of scenes. There's a bunch of new problems. There's some resolutions Then there's some new problems. This goes on and on until there's the oh my god moment, right? Which we would call the crisis in film world. The wow, things are going really terribly. Usually some main character dies or someone gets shot or there's just some new terrible information and it seems like maybe the hero won't make it through. That's right at the end of act two. But then something will happen that enables the hero to kind of crawl out of this terrible moment. And then we're into act three, act three. We know what we need to do. We're focused on finishing off whatever it is. And then there's a climax and then sort of the, the genuine, right? The kind of after the climax, we're back in the world where we started, but we've learned something new and we're a changed person, hopefully for the better. So we'll go through Indiana Jones 5 like this, right? I'll talk about the movie as we go. I will say I saw it two times, all two hours and 30 minutes of it. That's one of its problems. Two and a half hours. That is not needed. So I'll go through this. And then at the end, I think I'll talk about some things I really liked and then some fixes or at least what I think that they could easily do to make this a better movie. So getting started with act one, we fade in and actually the first thing we hear is a clock sound. We hear a tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, right? Oh, it's some sort of dial of destiny. Oh, it's some sort of clock thing. And There are so many tropes for Indiana Jones, right? There's so many things we expect. We see the Paramount Mountain. This is the first Indiana Jones movie where they don't fade into the image of some sort of mountain. They did that with all the other four Indiana Jones movies. They didn't do it with number five. And I think it was because they had to show the the Lucasfilm Limited card right after Paramount. It's kind of a bummer. You know, I do wish they kept that trope of fading into some sort of mountain image. They didn't. They, They didn't do it. And that, it's so funny, in that first five seconds of the movie, it already is telling you, This is going to be a little bit different, right? We have a different director. It's a different movie in a way than than the other four. Then all of a sudden we're in, we're running, right? And we are in a story that's taking place at the end of World War II. This is 1944 or 1945. And Indiana Jones is caught. He's caught by the Nazis. And we all of a sudden see a young Harrison Ford. Now, this is done, of course, using very, very complex computer methods. And for the next 20 minutes, we have one of those little vignette scenes that Indiana Jones is so famous for. They they steal this from James Bond, right? The idea of we're watching Indy at the end of one of his old adventures. And then once we get out of that, we will kind of use that as a springboard to a new adventure. So the first 15 or 20 minutes of the movie is a de-aged Indiana Jones. And there's all kinds of stuff that is going to go down in this uh, sort of Nazi end of World War II moment. We're going to meet His friend, Basil, who is this kind of small nerdy guy who, of course, we're going to learn is the father of 
Helena of the Phoebe Waller Bridge character. And while at first they seem to be after the Lance of Longinus, actually the Lance that is supposedly the one used to stab Jesus while he was on the cross, we quickly find out that's a fake. But on this train, a lot of this first scene takes place on a train that there's also the Antikythera device. And this, of course, is going to be used as the Dial of Destiny, which instantly made me feel really good because I predicted it. And on top of that, you can check back in, I believe, episode 96 of this very podcast where I went over the Antikythera device, which at this point is over a year old. And I listened back to it and, well, you can hear the positivity in my voice and the youthful excitement and exuberance and not like now the broken down old man I am. But if you want to know about the Antikythera device, go give that a listen. Now we find that this, this device is like the super special thing. It might have something to do with time travel. And at the end of this, Indiana Jones is actually able to get it you know, and jump off the train at the last minute with his friend Basil off the train and off a bridge into the water below. And then we are at the end of this really exciting adventure. Now, this is not the end of Act One. One of the problems I would say with uh, Indiana Jones 5 is Act One is really, really long. This is just the first part of it. And I have to tell you guys, most reviewers I've seen Talk about this part and they say it's really great. They're, they're like, oh, I really like that first 20 minutes. I didn't. I felt the CGI. I thought it worked by itself, but not as part of this movie. I think it's something that they could really take and run with for later. Like they could use this and make little vignettes of a young Harrison Ford or... They could use this as a spinoff and, and re-up the young Indiana Jones Chronicles or something. But as part of this movie, that CGI, I'm telling you, Indiana Jones just moves kind of weird. And the first 20 minutes of this felt like a cartoon. I'm just not a fan. Yes, it was exciting. Yes, it felt very much like kind of the old Indiana Jones. But you lose a lot in it. You lose Harrison Ford's really great improvisational physicality you know he really is like he has a physicalness to the way he acts and he's always messing around like with the stuff in the scene he always has little looks he always has little movements that add so much to the scene and these are gone because it's a fake harrison ford and you can really feel it to me it felt like like a superhero movie sometimes you know when spider-man he's just moving weird and it just feels like oh i'm watching a video game First 20 minutes of this movie are like that. And I'm a fan of that if it's somewhere else, but not as part of this movie. And when it ends, we then cut to modern time, modern time being 1969 and an old Indiana Jones. Right. And he's like asleep and he's drunk himself to sleep. He's in like a, you know, the equivalent of like a one bedroom apartment sort of in New York. He wakes up and he has like no shirt on. He just basically has his boxers on and he's like down on his luck. I don't like this scene very much. I think it really starts off on a very negative foot. More on that later. But anyway, he gets up, gets ready for work. We see that there's some divorce papers from Marion on the fridge and we get a hint that like his son has died in Vietnam, although that becomes much more obvious later. If you missed it, then it's OK. But anyway, this is just like a big downer, right? He goes to school to teach and instead of the students all liking him, they all think he's boring as hell. Again, I think this is not the world's best choice because I'm kind of like, why you have to be destroying my character? Why can't he be an old guy and still be cool in class? But while he's there being a sad professor, then we have the Phoebe Waller Bridge character, Helena, knowing everything, right? She's raising her hand. She's knowing everything. And Indiana Jones is like, wow. Then they meet each other 
soon after that in a bar she she comes in after him he's just sort of sitting in the bar he's he's retiring and she starts to talk with him about the antikythera device he recognizes her as basil's daughter he, he calls her wombat it's like his pet name for her and they have this discussion on the antikythera device and it seems kind of exciting. But of course, this is sort of the refusal of the call. Indiana Jones is like, ah, I'm too old. I don't really deal with that anymore. You know, and uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is like, ah, oh, come on. And he's like, no. So she leaves. But then we quickly find that the CIA is following Phoebe Waller-Bridge. It's kind of an odd juxtaposition there at the moment. We're like, OK. And then the stakes are raised a bit so he takes her into his lab and he shows her that he actually has the antikythera device the cia is after them they kind of corner them in the lab they're really harsh they have these these guys who are sort of working with the cia but they kill some of the people in there some of the other professors and stuff and then they have to get away Phoebe Waller-Bridge gets away. She locks the, the door so Indiana Jones can't get out. He's kind of trapped there. He has to fight his way out. He gets out, ultimately gets down to the street level, and they're having a parade. Of course, Phoebe Waller-Bridge gets away, but Indiana Jones ultimately has to get away from these CIA guys, and he does. He has this like cool little fight scene, which I thought was great. And like, all right, here's the Indiana Jones I want to see. He like, beats his way out of there. He beats up some of the guys. He takes like this sign from some of the parade people who are in the parade you like smack some other guys it's awesome and i gotta say you guys the sound effect they've used for 40 years for that hit that like smack hit i love that special effect it's like smack you know it's so great still use it so we're like shades of old indiana jones and this is great he gets on a horse there's a chase with it with him on a horse and a motorcycle behind him i think this chase really works it goes back to what I've said in the past, where simple chases like this are so much better than a ton of CGI. Now, I know there's some CGI in the horse chase, but there's not that much. And I think it's pretty cool because it's Indiana Jones on a horse and he just looks cool. I want Indiana Jones to look cool. And he does. So gets away on the horse. And now he's like, oh, my God, I think I might have to go on this journey. He finally meets he meets Sala. Sala comes back to him. We're like, yay, Sala. And he's talking with Sala and he learns that there's going to be this antiquities meeting. Obviously, outside of the United States, I believe in Tangiers or something like that. And he's got to go. All right. Right. This is the end of act one. It's like, OK, Indiana Jones has got to go fly to Tangiers. He's got to try and get the Antikythera device. He's got to meet up with Helena and see what's up. And he's off. Right. One thing I think they really missed here is Sala brings Indy a bag with his hat and his whip in it. And when he did that and Indiana Jones opened that bag, there should have been like the biggest musical crescendo there. And just a full on dun 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 dun, you know, and they didn't really do it. When we come back, act two and onward. Get everything for your next project at Menards and save big money. Enjoy a good night's sleep for less with a new Serta mattress. Shop today and save big. The better the mattress, the better the savings. Find the perfect mattress that fits your size and firmness needs at Menards. America's number one home improvement retailer for customer satisfaction, according to J.D. Power. Visit JDPower.com for details and Menards.com for deals. Save big money at Menards. This is Scott Campbell from the Stupid Things for Love podcast. I have a seven-year-old son, and the biggest mountain I climb every day is trying to put shoes on this child. And I'm so grateful to Skechers for making the only shoes my son will willingly put on by himself. Their slip-ons are amazing, and uh, he doesn't have to deal with laces, he doesn't have to deal with anything. They come in the perfect color blue, Thank you, Skechers, 
the Comfort Technology Company. And you can find Skechers everywhere. Skechers.com, a Skechers store, or wherever stylish footwear is sold. Hello and welcome back to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 121. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, and we have been reviewing Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I had gone over Act 1 in the previous segment, and I thought we would just keep on keeping on here with Act 2 and onwards to Act 3 and the end. So when we last left our intrepid explorer, Indiana Jones, he was off to Tangier. And so he gets there. We're into act two, right? He's going to get the Antikythera device and he gets to the meeting. And of course, there's kind of a uh, what's going to be a big chase scene. It starts with him crashing the party of the antiquities meeting. We have a flashback with. Indiana Jones talking to Basil like like 15 years before or this kind of thing, because it turns out that Basil, Helena's dad, has gone crazy with the Antikythera device, right? He's just too focused on it and he's just sort of gone over the top and off the deep end. So we have this flashback, which I think which I think works overall. We are introduced to Teddy, this little kid, kind of a short round part two. Teddy is like learning to fly from one of the pilots in the bar there. Just and Teddy has just sort of a fake pilot cockpit set up in front of him. And this is like the world's worst foreshadowing. We're like, all right, when's he going to fly a plane? I think this was a terrible choice. I think they should just cut it. And just later, like it could, we could just be like, oh, Teddy knows how to fly. It could be one line. Oh, my dad taught me. Okay, don't show us this terrible, weird bar scene thing. So then we have, as we're grabbing for the Antikythera device, we then have a very long tuk-tuk chase, which are these little, almost go-kart, the little vehicles that you'll find in in other areas of the world. You know, these very small, like three-wheeled vehicles, kind of like golf carts. This chase is long. This It's not nearly as good as the horse's. And it's just it goes on. And there's one point where it like kind of stops and there's kind of descending action for a minute. And then they do more of it. And you're like, oh, no. OK, we get it. OK, there's a chase. And of course, finally, it resolves itself. At which point there's a there's a helicopter scene where the CIA is in the helicopter with the bad guy. I haven't even talked to the about the bad guy, the main villain. Right. And he's. Who is it? I think it's Mads Mikkelsen or whoever, Mr. Bad Guy, who was also a bad guy in James Bond. He was the bad guy in Casino Royale, I believe, who bled from his eye. (laughs) But he's a great villain. I thought he did a great job. I thought he was a great Indiana Jones villain. And of course, he's like a Nazi in disguise. You know, he the idea he's like a Werner von Braun kind of character. He's brought in by the United States to help with the space program. And but Underneath it all, he secretly wants to bring back the Third Reich, right? It's a good villain. He is even torn in terms of working for Hitler and all this kind of stuff, even though he wants to bring the Reich back. He he really is super focused on the archaeology, too. It's a it's, it's good job of, of making a bad guy with some... Mm, that's more than just one-sided, you know, a little bit more complexity to him. So we are then learned that uh, we need to go get the other, not the other piece of the Antikythera device. We need to get this other thing that is basically the directions to the Antikythera device. And they're still on the boat. This is where they pull the real Antikythera story in terms of sponge divers finding it and everything. So they have to go back to Greece. We see that Antonio Banderas is actually this diver guy who can help them out. They uh, do this dive scene, which I actually thought was really good. Being a diver myself, I thought that they got the feeling of diving on film quite well. Good for them. You know, in terms of once you watch it, all you hear is the breathing, which is what happens when you're scuba diving. And they go down 
to the ship. And of course, it's really, really deep, you know, and um, there's a bunch of eels and they have to try and get this like thing to decode the Antikythera device. And of course, while they're down there, the bad guys get to the boat and they start cutting the air hoses. And, you know, it's it's a very typical Indiana Jones exciting scene. I thought it worked. I thought the diving thing worked, man. It was fantastical. It was a little bit over the top, but it was cool. I mean, why not, man? And this is also possibly the first time where you see Helena, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, right, helping Indiana Jones, actually comes back to help him. One real downer with the Helena character is she's really harsh on Indiana Jones and tells a thousand and one, like, old people jokes and i think it's a real low point for the movie it makes her very unlikable and i'll talk a bit about about that later but we finally thank god see her trying to help them <laughs> they do end up having to rocket to the surface and me as a diver i'm like oh my god everyone just got the bends and is dying but they needed to do that for the movie they are able to turn the tide on the villains and escape on the villain's own little boat. And they are now off to Sicily or is it Sicily? I could be wrong. It might be Syracuse or no, is Sicily on Syracuse? I don't know. Geography <laughs> where they're going though, is the cave, the, the cave of the ear where, where basically you go in there. Yeah, it's in Syracuse. Wherever it's loudest, this is basically where they're going to dig. They have to go through some bugs. We do see that Helena doesn't like bugs, which thank God we finally see something that she doesn't like or isn't perfect at. We needed more of that earlier. But ultimately, we do get to the tomb of Archimedes. And that's great, right? This is where the other piece of the Antikythera device is. We also see that Archimedes has a wristwatch on and we're like, oh, my God, this is a time travel device. We also find that Teddy, the kid, gets kidnapped, but he is ultimately able to escape. And of course, right as they're about to put the Antikythera device together, the bad guys show up at the tomb. They get the Antikythera device and they put it together for themselves and Indiana Jones is also shot. So this is the crisis moment, right? This is where everything is going terrible for our heroes. And we as an audience were like, oh, my God, the bad guys have the Antikythera device. Indiana Jones is shot. The This is looking pretty bad, you know. And luckily, we also have Helena kind of going, oh, my God, we can't leave him. We can't leave Indiana Jones, you know. But now... We have to get to the airfield right now. We're going to basically follow the bad guys and try and get the Antikythera device and try and make things right. So we're climbing out of the terribleness of Indy getting shot and the bad guys having the Antikythera device. We get to the airfield. Helena gets on a motorcycle and actually drives it up towards a plane that's starting to take off, which I actually thought was OK. It obviously strains credibility. Riding a motorcycle to catch a plane that's on takeoff and she gets in the wheel well and all that kind of good stuff. But I do think that was in keeping with the vibe of Indiana Jones. I was cool with it. You know, why not? And of course, the bad guys have taken Indiana Jones along on the plane this is also, of course, where Teddy the kid flies another plane to catch up. He's never flown a plane before. Why do we have to do this? Why did they do this? Why not just say the kid knew how to fly a plane? His dad taught him. I'd go with that. The whole scene. This is one of those times, man, where it's like the world of a thousand rewrites. I'm like, who thought? I don't know. This must have been some half idea 14 versions ago that stayed in the script or something. I don't know, because watching it, you're like, what a terrible choice. This could have been so much better. So the little plane follows the big plane. All our characters are going into this time vortex. And the idea with the villain is he's going back to like 
1938 in order to kill Hitler, actually, and take over and make all the right choices. So the third right, because he finds that the weak link in the chain is Hitler, right? You get rid of Hitler and then and then the Nazis can take over. He can do everything right. But we find out that it's all messed up and the time travel takes them back to the Battle of Syracuse in 214 BC. Now, I'm usually not a fan of this kind of thing. Time travel, I think, sucks almost every time in movies like this. But I swear to God, you guys, I think it worked. I think it was OK. I was like, I was like, oh, my God, I think this is working. It seemed Indiana Jonesy. I don't know. Like for Indiana Jones 4, I was so against the whole aliens thing. I mean, maybe it's because I, well, run this podcast. But even with that, I just thought it was so high concept. I was like, dude, this is lame. But shockingly, I was cool with the time travel. So they're in 214 BC. Basically, Helena shoots the bad guy. Indiana Jones and her jump out of the airplane with the parachute as the plane with the bad guy in it crashes. And... I would like to write a little note of thanks to the writers of Indiana Jones 5 and say that when the plane crashed, the bad guy was indeed dead. We didn't have that stupid like, I'm still alive in the wreckage. I'm coming to get you. Right. That would have sucked so bad. I was totally waiting for that. It didn't happen. Thank God. So the bad guy is vanquished. And then we meet. Archimedes. And that's really awesome. And I think that what's really nice there is there's a real deep scene with Indiana Jones and Helena. Just about Indiana Jones says he wants to stay there. And Helena's like, no, you can't. A really deep, dramatic scene, which I thought worked. And they also had a deep, dramatic scene back in Act Two on the dive boat when Indiana Jones talks about the death of his son. Really, really nice. And both actors, I thought, did a great job on both of those. And not every Indiana Jones movie has that. Indiana Jones 4 didn't have any deep scenes like that, right? But this one does. And, I, and those scenes are gold, you know? Nice, human, real. They're sad. They're poignant. Good for them. You know, I really liked those. So Helena's like, Indy, you can't stay. You're going to ruin history. He's like, I'm tired. I got nothing to live for. I want to stay. And she's like, sorry, man. And she punches him out. We wake up. He's back in his apartment in 1969. And Helena's there. And of course, in walks Marion. Right. And Marion and... Indiana Jones end up having a really nice, this is the third one, right? Nice, poignant, human scene. Sort of a flip from the scene of the original Indiana Jones scene where when Marion asks, you know, um, is there a place it doesn't hurt? And Indiana Jones points to his elbow. There's a flip of that. And... You know, the these two people end up kissing, right? And and sort of making up. And that's the end of the movie. It, it, a very nice end. And of course, they fade to black and then play the Raiders of the Lost Ark March. And hey, good for them. When we return, my final thoughts and some tips and tricks on Indiana Jones 5. Get everything for your next project at Menards and save big money. Enjoy a good night's sleep for less with a new Serta mattress. Shop today and save big. The better the mattress, the better the savings. Find the perfect mattress that fits your size and firmness needs at Menards. America's number one home improvement retailer for customer satisfaction, according to J.D. Power. Visit JDPower.com for details and Menards.com for deals. Save big money at Menards. 
saving money on everything for your projects at Menards. Update your outdoor space with our huge in-stock selection of AC2 pressure treated lumber, decking and fencing. Load up big savings using our drive through lumber yard. Plus get free estimates fast using our deck and fence design programs. Menards, America's number one home improvement retailer for customer satisfaction, according to JD Power. Visit jdpower.com for details and menards.com for deals. Save big money at Menards. Stock up on everyday essentials at Menards and save big money. We're your one-stop shop for pet food and supplies. Blue Buffalo Dog and Cat Food is made with real meat and natural ingredients that your pets will love. Save big on Blue Buffalo Pet Food at Menards, America's number one home improvement retailer for customer satisfaction, according to J.D. Power. Visit JDPower.com for details and Menards.com for deals. Save big money at Menards. Hello and welcome back to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 121. I'm your host, Andrew Kinkella, and we have been discussing Indiana Jones 5, otherwise known as Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. So we've gone through the three acts, right, from beginning to end. And I told you at the very top that I'm torn about this movie there's parts i really like and parts that i think are quite weak and where does that leave us i man i don't know i i have to say you know what let's start with what i liked what i liked about this movie okay as i talked about in the previous segment the serious scenes I thought the serious scenes of the death of Mutt, of uh, Indiana Jones not wanting to go home, and Marion coming back were all excellent. And it just shows you what we want as human beings. We don't need all the explosions and shit, right? We just need a simple scene between two characters with close-ups on their face and we see how they feel. And I know that Phoebe Waller-Bridge has gotten a lot of negative publicity from this, but I thought as an actress, she did great in those. And that's what really matters. So serious scenes, a big thumbs up. The use of the Antikythera device as this time travel thing and, of course, as kind of the MacGuffin, the thing that they are trying to get and what's driving the story along, I thought was great. And you're like, wait a second. Andrew Kinkella, host of the pseudo archaeology podcast, thought the use of the Antikythera device was great in this. Sure. Because again, this isn't on the history channel. This is Indiana Jones. It's fine. You know, of course, in reality, the Antikythera device is much more something that was used just to kind of trace the planet's And Trace Days of the Week and this kind of thing. But that usage as a plot device, I got no problems with it. I thought it was fun. I really liked the villain. I thought that was great. Again, we want we want someone who's deep. We want someone who we like to hate. Right. We want to think of like Hannibal Lecter is the best villain of all time. Right. We love Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. Right. Remember, he eats people. Remember that? But you still like him. Right. This guy is like a Nazi. But you still like him. You know, you still kind of feel for him. And that's that's the sign of a good villain. You know, they can they're they're terrible, but you're still like into it. <laughs> So you're all just you're all bad people. You like you like Nazis and people who eat people. What's wrong with you? So those are good, right? The whole tomb of Archimedes scene. The idea of going to the tomb. I thought the tomb was really cool. It's like interesting. Uh, the time travel thing. I can't believe it. I got to give a ma- massive props for that working. Right. I'm sh- time travel stuff. I always think sucks. But I don't think it did this time. The dive with the eels and stuff. I thought the overall dive scene was well done. Very in the mode of Indiana Jones. 
the horse chase was great and the badass indie beating people up right before the horse chase right on that's what i want indian jones i don't care if he's 80 years old he's beating people up and it seems realistic so there's some stuff that i thought this movie really did well and when i watched those scenes i was like yeah now on the flip side okay there's parts that i didn't like so much but but i'm not here to just like bitch and moan about the parts I didn't like. How do we fix this? How do we? Here's a couple easy things I think that could be done to make this movie better. Like you could make this director's cut in like a weekend. And I think it would just be so much better. Here's here's what you do. Go with me on this. First, I'll try and go through from beginning to end. First, cut the first 20 minutes. This movie is two and a half hours long. You don't need the cartoony. Indiana Jones as young. Look how much CGI we can do. I don't care. It plays fake. It plays weird. And I know it's not really Harrison Ford because it's like not him. He's like his not improv fun self. Cut it. Cut the part of Indiana Jones waking up in his underwear. I don't want to see that. I almost had to turn away. You can even cut the part where he gets dressed in the morning. Here's what you do instead. Start which is the montage of images. We hear some kind of the maudlin Indiana Jones music, you know, the, the sort of slower Indiana Jones, looking at Indiana Jones, images of his past adventures. Just give me a montage of photos. You could do that in an afternoon. And then start with him in the classroom. And then just the fact that the students are asleep and stuff and not into it, that already tells us something's a little wrong, right? We don't need to be beaten over the head. We don't need to see a half naked, half drunk Indiana Jones. That's just a bummer. We can be bummed out enough knowing that he's not a great college professor anymore. So cut all that stuff out. You start right there. One of the big problems with this movie is act one is way too freaking long. So that'll shorten it up. And then we just kind of lean into this story that's a bit different than the other four Indiana Jones movies. And it's okay, right? After this, let's start cutting all the, hey, you're so old jokes. And that would be easy. Half of them, Phoebe Waller-Bridge says like, as an aside, or almost when her backs to the camera, you can just literally cut the sound and keep going. It would be so easy, right? We don't want to make her seem so negative. So we cut those. There's a bunch of them. There's a time when she says, oh, your hat makes you look two years younger. It's just jerky and lame. You can cut it. There's the part where she traps Indy in his own office for the CIA agents to get him. I don't think that's necessary. Cut the scene where she actually traps him. She can still just be seen to get out of the office without him. And then he can still be shouting after her and she's just gone. That's okay. You don't have to show her being an overt asshole, right? Like, oh, I'm trapping you in here. There's no reason for that. No reason for her to be so harsh and cruel to him. There's a quote when they're having the tuk-tuk chase that where she is just bragging about herself. I'm smart and I'm beautiful. Cut it, right? It's understood. We see her be too great already where she's just good at everything. When she also talks about how good she is, it's like we're straining credibility. We already see you're almost too good. Let's cut that. Bragging is not attractive. So easy scene. Tuck, tuck scene. Chase is too long anyway. Cut it. Easy peasy. I, I'm, I feel weird because I'm like, dude, I, I'm not making this movie, but I'm also like, This is an easy edit, man. Cut the scene of Teddy learning to fly. It's idiotic. And and cut the scene where Phoebe Waller-Bridge says, like, you've never flown a plane at all. Just cut it. You can even add in his voice going like, my dad taught me. And you wouldn't even notice. You cut it in when his back's to the camera. This happens way more often than you think in movies. You know, just to fill in little plot holes and stuff. There's little stuff. There's a 
car screech at the airport when Sala saying goodbye to Indy and the idea is Indy so doddering that he walked out into traffic. Just cut that. There's no reason. Why do we have to keep trying to show Indy as a doddering old guy? We want to show him as conflicted, but still cool. Oh, and then, of course, when Sala gives him his bag with his whip and hat, since we've cut the beginning, we haven't really seen the whip and hat much, if at all. Give that sucker a huge musical sting. Bum, 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 bum. Right on his stuff. You know, that would be so cool. Oh, they missed that trick. And it, it, it's so iconic, right? So if you do that and see, I think, I think their act three is pretty good. If you cut the first part of act one, tighten up act two, and then Phoebe Waller Bridge is actually nicer to Indy as we go. We cut out a bunch of those jerky one liners. She seems like a more compassionate character. Everything cool. I'm telling you guys, telling you a weekend director's cut, dude. It's going to it'll it'll time out at like two hours and five minutes or something like that. So much better. You're welcome, world. You're welcome. A couple more things. People ask for rankings on these. You know, how would you rank the five Indiana Jones movies? Here's what I would say. One and three are obviously the best ones. And people will argue what's better, one or three. I'm always a huge fan of the original, so I will put one first. And three as a very close second. They're basically, you know, trade in places for number one. I would say the same thing with Star Wars, actually. I prefer the original Star Wars movie to Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I said it. And I'm telling you, really go watch Star Wars, you guys. Watch the original. Watch it again. Watch it in seriousness. Nobody home. Sit down. Watch that sucker. And you're like, Good Christ, is this a good movie? It is. And I'm telling you, Empire Strikes Back. Cloud City drags a little. Let's be honest. They're there a long time. A little slow. Anyway, I'm always going to give. So Indiana Jones, I, I rank one as number one. And that also has Marion. You have Marion Ravenwood. She's such a great character and such a great actress. Right. So good. Iconic. So one Three is close. Three is close, close, close second. You know, Sean Connery. It's great. And then, of course, four is the worst one. And I still do think that. So one and three. Great. Four. Pretty terrible. Now you have this weird doldrums middle. Does it go one, three, five, two, four or one, three, two, five, four? I don't know. And who cares? But I would say five and two are somewhere in that middle ground. I, if I had to vote right now, I think I might even like five a little better than two, this one, but it, it just depends on what we're talking about. Each one of them, five and two are similar because, so this is Temple of Doom, right? Because they both have really good scenes, really cool scenes, and scenes that really need some help. Again, ultimately, who cares? But that's what I would say. Obviously, one and three are way up there. Four is down and two and five are, you know, exchanging blows in the middle ground. Finally, the second time I watched this, I watched it with my daughter. And she's 15. And I really was interested in what she thought. And there were a couple things. First, right at the end of the movie, right, it goes to black and they start to play the Raiders March. And I'm like, I'm like, hey, hey, Grace, it's time to go. And she's like, just a second. I'm vibing. <laughs> Dude, the youth, she was vibing to Raiders March. Like, good for her. The other thing she said, she liked the villain. I'm like, yes. She also said something I thought was really, really interesting. I'm like, hey, Grace, what did you think of the movie? She's like, you know, as a standalone movie, I thought it was really good. But as an Indiana Jones movie, I didn't think it really fit. And I'm like, 
That's interesting. You know, because I think I think for those of you who've watched the movie, you can kind of see what she means. And it can be from a lot of reasons. I think part of it is because they pushed the Phoebe Waller Bridge character too much. They kind of, you know, Indiana Jones took a bit of a back seat at certain times. I, I can see that. So good for her, man. There's hope for the youth of tomorrow. With that, you know, it's just there are so many critics and so many things online, you know, that that talk about this, including myself. <laughs> I hope those of you who are fans of Indiana Jones, go watch it. Go watch it in the theater. It still has love it or hate it. It still has the music. It still has Harrison Ford. It still has adventure. It still even has the font. It's so funny at the beginning. I'm like, oh, my God, the font. It, it's an enjoyable movie to watch in a theater, even with whatever faults it may have. So, hey, man, go remember the good old days. Let the movie wash over you. And with that, I'll see you guys next time. Take her easy. Thanks for listening to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast. Please like and subscribe wherever you like and subscribe. And if you have questions for me, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, feel free to reach out using the links below or go to my YouTube channel, Kinkella Teaches Archaeology. See you guys next time. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.